Hey guys, welcome to another Python tutorial for beginners. In today's video, we'll talk about loops in Python. So loops is a term that we use to iterate over various different data types in Python. And a lot of the data types that we've talked about in previous videos are considered as iterable, meaning the data types that we can iterate through. So in today's video, I'll try to provide a general introduction of what iteration is, and then the benefits of loops. And we will get into more details about different types of Python loops in next few videos. So without further ado, let's get into this. So before we actually get into talk about the loops, let me show you an example of accessing each element by element in the list data type. So let me first create a list here. So I'm going to say list one and one, two, three with a triple A as a string and triple B. So I have a list with some integers and strings. Let's first think about how we can print out each of the elements in the list one. The obvious way of doing this is to use the list indexing that we have learned and print each of the element one by one. So what I can do here is that I can say print list one square bracket index of zero, which is the first element, the element one here. And then I can do the same thing for the all other elements. So let me just copy this and then just change the index to one, two, three, and four. So the list one index of zero will print out one and two and three and the triple A here, oops, and then the triple B here. And so now if I run this, then you will be able to see all the elements in the list one print out line by line because we have a five different print statements. And obviously this approach will work as long as you can increment the each of the index that we've specified manually one by one. But this is a bad idea if you have a thousands of elements within the list one here. Because there is no point of us using the programming if you were to prepare all thousand elements manually by yourself with the indexes like this. So in this case, we can use loops to save our time and reduce the lines of code that we have. And loops allows us to loop through, meaning iterate over each of the elements that we have in the list one without us actually manually specifying the indexes like this. So assume that if we are looping through the list one, in the first iteration, it will grab the first element, which is one. Second iteration will grab the element two. Third iteration will grab the element three. And fourth iteration, it will grab the element triple A. And then the last iteration, it will grab the last element, which is the triple B. So what this means for us is that by just doing a simple iteration over the list one, we gained an advantage that we no longer have to write five lines of print statement with manually specifying the indexes like this. So then let me simply convert this five lines of print statement with a for loop. So for loop is one of the way that we can iterate through the iterable data type in a definite way. Meaning for loop will only loop through until the point that you've defined it. And it utilizes the keyword for, and that's why it's being called as a for loop. And and by default, for loop iterates each element within a given iterable one by one until the end of the element. So let me write a simple for loop here. So I can do for element in list one. So now I've just wrote a single line that starts with the keyword for, and to the next, I will specify the name of the element that we will loop through. You can name this whatever you want. And to the right, I've specified the membership operator in, and finally, I've specified the target list, which is the list one. So this is pretty self-explanatory, but in here, I'm telling the for loop to iterate through each element in the list one. And within the for loop, I want to actually print each of the element out. So I can do print element. And let me also write a divider here so we can see the clear difference between the above five lines of print statement and then the below for loop. And so if I run this one more time, then at the top, you will see the result coming from the five lines of print statement, which is one, two, three, triple A and triple B. And then we have this equal sign, which is a divider. And if you scroll down, then you will see an exactly identical result, one, two, three, triple A, triple B coming from this for loop here. So as you see in the screen right now, the idea here is that the for loop actually started with the first index in the list one, which is one here. And then it actually moved to the second iteration, which has the element of two, and then to the three, and finally to the triple B, up until the last element is reached. And once the last element was reached, the for loop automatically stopped. And so that inside the for loop, we had a print statement of printing out the element that it was looping through. And that's why we see the five exactly same elements as we have in this uh, five lines of print statement. So then now, before we get into more about the for loop, let's learn about some of the useful functions and control statements that we can use with the for loop. So the first one is pass. So we learned about the pass when we talked about the function, but pass is basically a synthetic sugar to indicate that you don't have any functionality inside this for loop, but you still want the Python interpreter to run properly. So for example, if I delete this print statement, and just run it as is, then Python will complain saying that it has a syntax error unexpected EOF while parsing. So this basically means that you don't have anything inside the for loop. 
But if we put the pest as a synthetic sugar within this for loop, so this for loop does not contain any logic, meaning that it doesn't have any print statement or it doesn't have any other programming learning inside the for loop, but we still want the Python interpreter to run properly with this for loop structure. And if I just run this one more time with a pass statement, then for loop will not print anything because you don't have anything. And at the same time, Python's interpreter will not complain because you have this uh, synthetic sugar, meaning the placeholder pass within the for loop here. Uh, so this pass statement can be useful if you want to leave a section inside the for loop block without any behavior, but still want the for loop to run properly and recognized properly by the Python's interpreter. Okay, so then now let's talk about continue. So continue allows us to move to the next element in our iteration. So let me write a simple for loop with a simple if statement. So I can do for element in list one, and then I can say if element is equal to triple A, then I want to run the continue. Otherwise, I just want to print the element out. So we just create our for loop here with the same structure as above. So for element in the list one, so we want to actually loop through each element in the list one. And inside the for loop, we have the if statement checking if the element, meaning the current iteration, is actually equal to triple A. If that's the case, then I want to continue, meaning that I want to actually jump to the next iteration, which has the element of the triple B. Otherwise, I want to print out the element. So what's gonna happen here is that the for loop will start with the element of one because it has the index of zero. And so that it's gonna check, does the element one actually equal to triple A? The answer is no, so it's gonna pass this if statement and just print the element one out. And same thing for the two and three. And whenever it actually gets to the triple A iteration, the element is now triple A and it actually equal to the triple A. So it's gonna come inside this if block and run the continue statement. And when the continue statement is run, the for loop will instantly go to the next iteration which has the element of the triple B. So the triple A will not be printed out because the continue statement was actually run before the print statement was executed. So if I run this, then you will see one, two, three, triple B, but you will not see triple A. So let's test that out. So if I run this, and you will see one, two, three, triple B here, which is an expected behavior because the element triple A went inside this if block and then the continue statement was run. And so that it just instantly moved to the next iteration, which has the element of triple B. Uh, so that triple B was printed out, but not triple A. So this continue statement can be useful because it provides us with some flexibility to manually move to the next element based on the logic that you have. So in our case, our logic was to check whether the element that's currently being iterated actually equal to triple A if that was the case, we ran the continue statement and upon running this continue statement, the iteration instantly moved to the next iteration, which has the element of the triple B. That's why the element triple B was printed out, but the element triple A was not printed out. Okay, so then now let's talk about the break. So as the name says it, break statement allows us to break out from the iteration, meaning basically stop the iteration. So let me simply copy and paste the for loop that we have above here and then paste it down here and then uncomment the entire for loop. So in here, let me just uh, replace this continuous statement with a break. So now what's gonna happen is that the for loop still stays as is, meaning it's gonna iterate from element one to element triple B here. And we have the same if statement. So if the current iteration, the element is the triple A, then it's gonna go inside this if statement and it's gonna run the break statement. And once the break statement is run, it's gonna instantly exit out from this for loop, meaning that this for loop iteration will be terminated. Uh, so what that means for us is that the element triple B will not be iterated because if the element was triple A, it's gonna run this break statement. So this print statement will not run and element triple B will not be run because the loop was already terminated right after the triple A. So let's test it out by running this. So if I run this, then you will see only one, two, three without the triple A or the triple B. So the break statement can be useful because you can control when you want to exit out from the loop based on your condition. So not only you can improve the performance of your program by not looping through to the end of the element, but also it gives you a control mechanism of when to loop or not to loop through. Okay, so now let's talk about the range function. So we can use built-in range function in a for loop to print out the number of specified indexes within the for loop. And this range utilizes the same logic that we have learned in the indexing and slicing videos, meaning it takes the start, stop, and stride as the argument, and it provides us the range of indexes for us to actually loop through. So let me first create a for loop here. So I can do for i in range function, and this range function takes the start and stop. So I can uh, start from the zero index, and then I want to stop at the index of four so that I have to actually specify the index of five here because the stop index is exclusive. 
and if I just print the i out and just run it, then you will see a 0, 1, 2, 3, 4 being printed out. And this makes sense because the range function starts from 0. So the first iteration is going to print out 0. The second iteration is going to print out 1, 2, 3. And the last index should be 4 because the stop index is exclusive. And so if you want to set the stop range to be the end of the index within the list data type that we have, this list has the five different elements, 1, 2, 3, triple A, and triple B. So how can you actually make the stop index to be the number of elements that we have in the list 1? For that, we can use the built-in function len. So instead of putting the 5 here, I can just simply do len and then function here and then put the list 1 as the argument. So this len list 1 will count the number of elements that we have in the list 1 which is 5. So this is basically the same thing as us printing the 5 here. So if I print this one more time, then you will see the exactly identical result uh, from 0 to 4 here, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4 being printed out because the LAN list 1 is basically identical to us basically manually setting the number 5 here. Okay, then now we have the indexes starting from 0 to 5, which is the LAN list 1 here. We can also use these indexes to print out the elements in the list 1. Let's look at the example that we did initially by manually specifying the index using the square bracket method. So for that, let me just simply copy and paste here. So we have this uh, 5 print statement with the list 1 index of 0 up until the list 1 index of 4 and this allowed us to actually print out each of the elements in the list 1. So is there any way that we can actually replace this 5 print statement in a same syntax format within this for loop and we already have all the indexes inside the for loop here which is this i. So what we can do here is that basically we can just do a print list 1 and square bracket I. And this will be basically the same thing as us running these five different print statements here because the only thing that we have changed here is the index here. So instead of us setting the manual index like this, we basically automatically pass the index that's generated from the for loop. So in the first iteration, this I will be zero. So the list one square bracket will be zero. And then in the second iteration, the I will be one. So then it's going to be list 1 square bracket 1 which is identical to the second print statement and third print statement we will have an index of 2 and then the next iteration we will have index of 3 and so on up until the index of 4 which is our last index here. So if I run this one more time by just commenting this and if I just run this then you will see the exactly same result 1, 2, 3, triple A and triple B basically all the elements in the list 1 were printed out line by line just like uh, us running the five different print statements like this. And this range function also takes a third argument which is a stride. So if I specify the stride of 2, this means that the range function will actually jump the index by 2. So if I run this one more time, so now then you will see 1, 3, triple B. So it started with an index of 0 which has an element of 1 and it jumped by two indexes. So it went to element three, which has the index of two, and then it jumped by index of two one more time. So it went to the triple B, which has the index of four. And also we can specify the different start index. So instead of zero, I can put one here and just run it one more time. Uh, then it's gonna start from two this time because we specify the start index to be the index one, which is two here. And another thing to note about the range function is that by default, the range function starts from index of zero. So that means that uh, we can just delete the start index and then also delete the stride and just run this one more time. Then you will see the 1, 2, 3, triple A and triple B coming out, which is the exactly same thing as you specify the index of 0 here and run it one more time. Then you will see the identical result 1, 2, 3, triple A and triple B. So using the indexing like this within the loop is another way to print out all the elements when you are iterating through the list string and tuple data types. And as we saw in the previous example, without the index, Python's for loop by default prints out all the elements without specifying the index. But there are certain scenarios where you want to manipulate iterations using the index to have a better control over the iteration process for the list, string, and tuple data types. So in that case, you can actually create your own index using the range function like this and pass the index with a square bracket method for the list, tuple, and string data types. Okay, so then now let's try to create an index out of range error. So we've learned in the list indexing and slicing video that if you try to access the index that does not exist, we got an index out of range error. And in this example, since we are passing the indexes, 
just like how we did it in the indexing video, it's possible that we can also get that same error. So let me first try the manual approach here. So let me just first uncomment this and then have another print statement here at the bottom. Uh, instead of having the index of four here, if I specify the index of five, which does not exist in the list one, because the ending index has the index of four. And if I just run this, then you will see the index out of range error saying the index error list index out of range. And this is expected because you are trying to access the element that does not exist. So in this case, the same rule can apply within the for loop. So let me first comment this again. And if I do a plus one on the stop index, so I'm gonna do plus one here and then just run this, then you reach the same exact error, index error list index out of range because now the land list one was a five, but we did a plus one. So now the stop index is a six and it's exclusive. So that it's gonna end at the index of five. So it's like the list one square bracket five here. Okay, so the final topic that we're gonna talk about is the else statement. So we've learned that the else statement from the conditional video where we use that with the if or else if statement. But we can specifically use the else statement with the for loop as well as without the if or the else if. So let me first create the for loop here. So for i in range zero and then len list one. And then if I just print list one square bracket i, so basically same thing as before. And let me also copy and paste the list one here. And let me also comment this so that we don't see the duplicate result. Okay. So now we have the list one and we have the for loop. So right below the for loop, same line as where the for loop actually starts, we can actually define the else block here. So else colon, I can just say print, the looping is done. So if I run this as is, then what's gonna happen here is that you will see one, two, three, triple A and triple B, basically every element that's coming out from this print statement. And then when the iteration is over, meaning that it actually reached the last index, which has the element of the triple B, then it's gonna go to this else block and print the final print statement, which says the looping is done. So this else block can be useful if you want to actually perform an action right after the iteration is over, then in that case, all we have to do is just define the else block at the same level as the for loop, and then just put whatever the code that you want to run after the iteration is over. Okay guys, that's it for this video. We've talked about the basics of iterations using the for loop. In our next video, we'll use for loop to iterate through the various different iterable data types and also have plenty of examples of common scenarios and operations that you'll be using in your program. And if you liked the video and found it helpful, please click the subscribe and like button. The subscription really helps for me to keep making these videos. And if you have any questions or comments, please comment down below. Thank you so much for watching and hope to see you in next videos.